Today, my guest is Frank Cottle. Frank is a futurist based in Southern California. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Frank about the future of commercial real estate. But first, a quick reminder, if you like the show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple things you can do to uh, help us out. You can like, you can share, and you su can subscribe. And as always, we'd love to uh, see your comments. Uh, so if you feel inclined, please leave a comment. We'd love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you'd like to see how uh, handsome our guests are, uh, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. And you can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And also, uh, please consider subscribing there as well. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Frank. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thank you, Darren. Really great to be here. And I don't want to add disappointment to your program right now, but if you want to see how handsome I am, you probably ought to look at a picture of me 40 years ago. <laughs> I'm always, always uh, humored by the, uh, the guest response of that, but uh, no, it's all in fun. And, and trust me, you're, you're uh, setting the, you're setting the curve on the, the positive side there. So nothing mm -hmm. to worry about. But um, Frank, before we uh, get into our talk about the future, uh, if you could share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Well, I've, uh, my career has spanned uh, five decades. Uh, I started in the late 60s, early 70s as a commercial diver, uh, of all things, uh, working uh, uh, independently and also as a contractor to one of our federal uh, agencies, uh, doing uh, what was termed interesting work for a few years. Um, uh, from there, I started uh, racing yachts. Um, I spent a decade racing uh, large sailing yachts um, uh, all over uh, and working to build a, a, a yacht brokerage uh, here on the West Coast based in uh, Newport Beach in California. Um, as I matured in that business a little bit, uh, we, were, we were quite successful. We got very lucky. Um, I made the decision that I would never be an owner so long as I was a broker. Uh, as a result of which I had to leave the, that uh, part of my work and I started in commercial real estate, 1979-80 time period. Um, I come from a ranching and farming family, so the concept of uh, land banking uh, was appealing to me, uh, buying dirt in the path of progress, if you will. Uh, but I didn't want to stay farming. I didn't want to go that route. Uh, so um, uh, we would buy large uh, parcels on the edge of master plan commercial developments sponsored by uh, Prudential Land, Chevron Land, Mobile Land, the Trammell Crow, Boston Properties, uh, the Irvine Company, the really big property master plan uh, developers. Um, and we would buy a little piece of land out there on the edge of their master plan project, the biggest piece we could buy with the most entitlement. And we'd put a small building out there, um, a 30, 40, 50,000 foot building. But we had three, four, 500,000 feet of entitlement uh, rights to go up, if you will. But the timing just wasn't right. So I had to figure out a way to hold the land. And we came up with this concept and watching what was going on, we figured out that these funny little things called executive suites generated the most revenue per square foot of anything commercial real estate. They were fairly unknown in the late 70s, although just starting as an industry. And so we built dedicated buildings that hosted and housed uh, shared workspace back in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, we built that portfolio for 10 years across the southwestern U.S. California, Arizona, and Texas. Uh, sold the portfolio in about 1990 and started building classic, what are referred to as business or co-working centers today. Uh, myself and two partners. Uh, we built uh, across the entire nation, 195 projects. Uh, we were the largest private operator in the industry at that time. Uh, and that portfolio was sold in 2000, right at the height of the dot-com boom. Good time to sell things. Uh, um, uh, well, the reason we sold that portfolio, um, that I wanted to sell at least, um, is that uh, I didn't like the risk exposure uh, of the lease liabilities on the properties uh, with landlords. Understanding real estate is a cyclical industry. 
Uh, and I wanted to own the customer instead of owning the centers. Uh, so we built the structure, the inventory control systems, and the technology to do that. And today we have clients in, uh, I don't know how many, uh, uh, in 54 countries, uh, about 1,100 facilities, uh, but we don't own the facilities. We just use those facilities in much the same way that Expedia uses the hotel industry uh, to service our customers. Uh, and uh, it's been a, a real fun ride, uh, taking us down a lot of interesting paths. And uh, today we're considered to be one of the progenitors of the flexible workspace industry. Uh, and we still try and push the limits daily. That's fascinating <clears throat> to hear you uh, talk about that. And then just thinking back about, uh, you know, executive suites and how that was such a, like a, a trend setting concept back in its uh, beginning there. Uh, and now you look at uh, well, the least workspaces is, is kind of a second. Um, I mean, people know what you mean when you, you know, co-work or, or, uh, um, God, what's the one that, uh, I'm drawing a complete blank. What's the, we work. Is that, I think that's one of the ones in that, uh, well, we, we work is, is kind of a interesting, uh, debacle. Um, <clears throat> they grew overly fast, not paying attention to some core fundamentals, uh, and got themselves in quite a bit of trouble. Um, they're referred to as the biggest deflated unicorn in the history of the market. Uh, and SoftBank, uh, who's their primary financial sponsor, uh, has lost multiple billions and billions so far on the company, uh, all through just too aggressive a business plan. Uh, they, again, not paying attention to the fundamentals. And, and one of the reasons I'm not in that business, I, they owned the centers, they were exposed to the leases, they had the huge capital expenses. Every time they wanted to capture another thousand customers, they had to build another center. And that cost them any place from 15 to 25, 30 million dollars in the combination of CapEx and leasehold liabilities. Um, if I want to do a thousand, add a thousand customers to my model, uh, I have to pay Google some pay per click uh, and then build them. That's it. So it's a technology driven company uh, in a software as a service model, servicing real estate uh, customers as opposed to a facilities-based model. Uh, we use others, the facilities that are owned by others. So are, are, you, are you leasing space then? Or are you, or no, are you it's more uh, driving uh, that? Uh, 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 we basically own the customer and we place ourselves and our customers into other flexible workspace facilities around the world. Um, think of Expedia uh, as a good example. Uh, we were around when they started. Some guys from Microsoft and knew them quite well. Uh, and uh, if you uh, run a hotel room uh, from Expedia, be a Hilton or a Marriott, um, you have a business relationship with Expedia, not with Marriott. Uh, they collect your money. They give you the special deal. They give you the loyalty program, et cetera. Um, and they have a deal, a wholesale deal transaction structure with Marriott, with a variety of hotels that allows them to put you in at a discount. So you may be paying uh, $500 for that room. Um, uh, Expedia is only paying $350 or $400 for that same room. And so they work on that wholesale margin uh, where they own the customer and the business relationship. But we do the same thing with commercial real estate. Uh, utilizing the flexible workplace uh, sector as our core inventory model. So it's very okay. much like the hospitality uh, structure. Got it. So you're, you're basically the marketing uh, broker arm for the, uh, the properties or the landlords or the property managers. Uh, like I said, you, you, you create the relationship with the occupant or the tenant. Uh, or the... That's, that's correct. And, and it's really, a. Um, uh, a scenario where uh, a lot of times people don't like to go direct. They feel they can get a better value by shopping across a platform like ours, or many times uh, they don't want to have relationships, larger customers in particular, um, don't want to have relationships with 20 different service providers. They want to have one contract with one aggregated service provider that can 
deal across multiple currencies, multiple contracts, multiple time zones. So in our model, you can come in and you can open 10 offices in 10 countries in 10 currencies in 10 minutes. Uh, it's very simple to do. Uh, you just drop into a website and open an office. Uh, and we can do that globally. We, uh, we've been operating globally since the early 2000s. Uh, and uh, it's a very effective uh, structure, especially for large customers. Uh, our largest individual customer right now has over 11,000 separate accounts with us to put things in perspective. You said 11,000? Yeah, one customer. Wow. And what's, what's a, uh, a, a, uh, an average client, if that's a, a single an average, largest? Average client in our model has about three to five uh, offices or virtual offices. Um, usually in multiple uh, cities. Um, and that's why they come to us. Again, they, it's much more convenient to work with a single inventory aggregator uh, than it is with uh, a five companies in five cities that might be independent to owned and operated with different types of contracts and uh, all of different types of billing cycles, et cetera. Uh, legal departments from large corporations love us because they have one contract to reveal. Uh, especially when they start going offshore. Um, right. That makes a big difference. Um, uh, and uh, our industry is very well suited for uh, companies that are global or international in scope. Um, uh, it, I don't know how much you know about human resources requirements in Singapore, as an example, or maybe in uh, Egypt. Don't know. Uh, nothing. <laughs> yeah. U usually larger companies don't either, and it's very costly for them to get into it. So they fall into our industry in general. Uh, large uh, providers like ourselves, another great provider is a, a company called International Workplace Group. They own the brand called Regis, uh, an excellent company also. Um, and uh, they, the larger clients and the multinationals uh, fall to structures like us, uh, uh, as well as local, a lot of local business as well. So do you, uh, you work with Regis then? Is that one of your providers? Uh, we we like Regis. Yes. Okay. They're a fine, fine provider. Uh, we work with them through our European offices, uh, primarily, uh, they're headquartered in, in Europe and we also have our own, uh, structure and offices and technology based companies based in continental Europe, a company called Flexido over there that they own. Got it. So from a user standpoint, if I've got uh, facility needs in multiple markets um, and maybe Regis isn't in those markets or whatever, and I go to you, you have contacts or relations with providers in those various markets. So I still just have the, the one point of contact as opposed to having to go to each market. And that, that and is correct. That is correct. And depending on which, whether we're using one of our directory structures and partnerships with various brokerages or our own internal inventory, we have between uh, 1,100 and 18,000 different facilities that we can access around the world. Gotcha. And um, <clears throat> as far as the, um, so, you, so you contract with the, the facility provider as a, is it like a referral type mark or are you actually? No, it's, we're a wholesaler. Uh, wholesale? Okay, we're, wholesale. a wholesale. okay. we're a wholesaler. Okay. Um, we have a, a predetermined contract and a predetermined discount rate with uh, every provider uh, that's inside of our system. Uh, and so we know exactly, you know, what our margins are, what our, our costs are, et cetera. And it's again, run very much in an e-commerce and software as a service type model. We have reservations and booking systems for meeting rooms, conference rooms. We have our own call centers to back up the offices with uh, live receptionists uh, around the world. Uh, <clears throat> Got it. So if, if I own a, a, um, an office um, facility and I'm looking to do some sort of, um, um, you know, what is, what's the, the broad term for this type of space? Is it, Shared space or is it? Um, a flexible workspace, flexible workspace. Uh, is the highest level. And think of, of that as including all providers that combine people, place, and technology into a single bundled service 
and provide it with a highly flexible service agreement as opposed to a long-term lease. That would include business centers, uh, co-working centers, incubators, accelerators, uh, culinary centers now, media centers. Um, it's that combination of people, place, and technology with a highly flexible service agreement to support it. And there are about 45,000 such facilities around the world today. Got it. So if I have a, a, a facility that I you know, have uh, space to lease, and uh, is there a way to contact you, or are you one that goes out and, and contacts me when you have a client that has a need? Um, a little of both. Uh, generally, uh, our inventory comes to us through our, our industry reputation. Uh, we don't really have a, a big sales team that goes out there. Um, we've been around for 40 years in this industry. Uh, so uh, people do know who we are and what we do. Uh, and uh, uh, our websites are very easily accessed uh, all over the world. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, we're more of a responsive marketing team than an outreach marketing team. Gotcha. Well, that's, that's an uh, interesting model, especially um, as uh, you know, space needs continue to change based on um, you know, the ability to work mobile or, or um, well, Just, right, right yeah. now, uh, think, think about it. Uh, today, uh, uh, we've got about 1.8 billion mobile workers in the world. And yeah. look at what's happening with um, uh, our, our current uh, pandemic of the month, I guess I'll call it. Yeah. You know, the coronavirus. How many people have started working remotely and telecommuting just in the last 60 days globally? Right. Millions and millions and millions. Okay, they can do that because of technology. They can do that because all companies, all corporations, and, and government itself um, knows they have to have flexible workplace plan plans if they're going to win the talent war uh, in recruitment right now, which is critically important. Um, people are looked at looking very much at balancing lifestyle um, with their work style, uh, and so having again, a flexible workplace plan where you can work from an office, you can work from a co-working center, you can work from Starbucks, you can work from your home. Uh, all of these things blend into a new sort of real estate 2.0 or 3.0, I guess now, uh, approach. And the, our industry, the, the flexible work sector, is a core component to uh, solving that mobile work uh, issue. Yeah, and let me ask you about just the the um, you know the the use of space because I mean obviously the the te technology uh, avails itself now to where literally you can work from home, you can work from the coffee shop, you can work from uh, wherever. But the 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 fundamental need of a a, a space that has certain attributes uh, features like an office. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever see that like, uh, I mean, have you seen it change in, in the time you've been in, in, in uh, engaged in this oh, uh, yeah. market? A ab absolutely. Um, uh, number one, we all need a place to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need a place to work where we can focus. Uh, so it's usually not the kitchen table isn't the best place. Uh, and it's certainly not Starbucks. Uh, good coffee, bad place to work. Right. Uh, um, even though you see a lot of people with laptops in there, uh, uh, you see people with laptops and tablets everywhere. You know, it, it's like a, an appendage these days. Right. Uh, and I'm as guilty of that as anybody. Yeah. But but we all need places to work, and we like to work around people. Um, we 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 as human beings, we are uh, gregarious. Uh, we we enjoy being around others and sharing with others. Uh, Etc. Uh, so you have to find environments that combine uh, the technology, which today bandwidth is like air to oxygen to all of us. We have to have massive amounts of bandwidth and has to be secure bandwidth. We have to have a productive workplace. It's not too far from the house because we're very environmentally conscious now, or we want it to be near public transportation. We want to have amenities around that. Uh, I'm, 
forgot about our interview this morning and didn't know it was on video. So I'm dressed because I'm going to the gym right after this. <laughs> um, so we want to have amenities uh, around us, uh, good restaurants, uh, health clubs, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, and all of those things need to be combined into that perfect location. Uh, but most importantly, we want to be around people that we like. So when I say people, place, and technology, I'm not just talking about the support services, clerical, secretarial, administrative support that facilities provide, but I'm talking about the community of people that are working in the facility as well. Um, it, 10 years ago, people would look up an address and they'd say, oh, I want to be on that street at that address. And they would see pretty pictures of a nice facility and say, oh, that looks like a great office. Today, they'll go onto Facebook and they'll, they'll, they'll find that address. But before they really look at that location's pretty pictures, they're going to go onto Facebook and say, who's there? What's happening there? Who, what sort of activities are going on there? And then they'll come back to the website. Um, so the community that you surround yourself with is as important today as the facility within which you work. And that has to do with everything from communities that are focused on social responsibility and charitable structures, nonprofit structures, on up to highly technical communities where all of the most brilliant programmers from Google are going to end up doing their spare work. Um, uh, so that's a very important component now in, in office selection. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, because in one way, I feel like people have uh, essentially isolated as much or more than ever before, but connected virtually, like what we're mm -hmm. doing right now. Correct. Um, so there, there is that, that uh, the virtual connection, uh, but still the, the, the physical, you know, proximity to, to be in, in or amongst people and, and be able to have a community of whatever that space looks like or whatever that, you know, your requirements are, uh, recognize that as still being a, a, there's still some sort of a social need. Oh, a very important, <clears throat> very important aspect to that. Um, uh, again, we're, we're working remotely because we can, but um, uh, today I'll be in uh, this type of a meeting. I'll be in a, a workplace environment that has other people uh, as well. Uh, and I'll be socializing, like you say, I'll be going to the gym in an hour. Uh, so uh, we, we have different patterns that we need to involve to have a balance in our lives. And it's not just sitting in a room uh, with a headset and a microphone on 24 seven. Right. That, that's a little lonely. Um, and if you look at mental health, loneliness is an epidemic uh, as a result of some of the technology isolation that we we've used today. Um, so having a place to go uh, where you have a community that you enjoy being with is an elemental to uh, that work-life balance. No, I definitely agree. Um, you know, and, and as you mentioned uh, with the, um, uh, the Corona virus uh, and all of its, uh, you know, just amazed at just how the tentacles keep reaching and just how you know, like Italy currently is essentially shut down and just this uh, just trying to minimize the spread we're trying to minimize the movement of people and the minimize the movement of the uh, the germs or whatever um, are you seeing any kind of an uptick in in um, uh, space demand because I you know like even I think uh, like Amazon and I know that other companies have kind of restricted travel for their employees mm -hmm. um, is that affected your business? Um, we don't know yet uh, from a, because January and February were both record months. So we don't know whether it's affecting us on the positive side or whether there'll be a whiplash effect on the negative side. Uh, I think in our sector, um, where a lot of people use um, our type of space as secondary or tertiary space, uh, a lot of large corporations do, um, while we're used very strategically, um, we're, people aren't in the office all day long, every day. Um, 
we like virtual officing. Uh, we like uh, workstations, uh, drop-ins, uh, hot desking. We like all of these factors. And that seems to be part of a solution uh, 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 overall. Um, if you look at um, large corporations and, and the way that their uh, facilities are laid out with big cube farms oftentimes or big open workspaces with a multitude of, of, of people, um, that's what uh, people are trying to keep away from right now. Um, so we, again, we, we aren't seeing a negative aspect, but I think it's too, too soon to tell whether people will just I, stay at their home. Uh, if so, they'll be using our call centers. <laughs> so yeah, you know, yeah, we're, we're fine. We're but fine. I, I was even just kind of curious if not so much of a, you know, a, a negative is, is a potential for a, you know, positive, a guy has, you know, if there's a, a, a group of people in a certain region that are used to traveling, but, you know, for the, the short time or, you know, looking not to, and they're saying, I, I can't work from home. I got to get, you know, someplace I can see that. Uh, some sort of a um... well, we we are seeing a little up uptick in the hot desking um, the drop in type business uh, mm -hmm. right now, um, but it's not uh, it's not large enough to call it a a, a trend reaction. Gotcha. We're just seeing a, a small uptick in that. I think for a short issue uh, like the face it, the coronavirus is 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 got a label, it's got a name, et cetera, but it's the flu. Right. We have the flu every year, and right. this seems to be a little bit more virulent, and it seems to uh, get a, be getting a lot more press. But people go through this type of a structure every year, and so the normal reaction is you go home and work for a few days, or you right. work, you know you you just stay away from all offices for a few days. Um, but it doesn't seem to affect the occupancy rates or the migration in occupancy for real estate in general. Right. Right. So we've talked a little bit about kind of the, the, I guess the, from where you started to where things are have evolved to, um, do you have any kind of a sense of how things will continue to progress as far as this, um, you know, this class of real estate and how it's used in, in your business? Well, if I go back to the way it was originally used in the early 80s, we had uh, the predominance of the uh, clients, um, we refer to them as members now, um, uh, were uh, legal accounting financial services professionals. They were used, they were the biggest users uh, uh, and most stable users within the classic old style executive suite environment. Uh, that migrated to small technology companies, uh, uh, marketing and media companies, et cetera, coming in. But it was primarily smaller companies. In the early 2000s, the migration started shifting to larger companies. Um, uh, uh, they recognized uh, through the dot-com and then dot-bomb uh, issues that went on um, in the late 90s through the early 2000s, that flexibility was key. You had a lot of large companies, particularly large tech companies, that built massive campuses during the dot-com boom, only to have them sitting 40, 50, 60% empty three or four years later. And their balance sheets reflected a tremendous amount of debt. Uh, yeah. And that went on all over. So flexibility. And today, the CEOs and the CFOs that are running larger corporations, they're looking at their employment life cycle, which is around seven and a half years for the average employee within most large Fortune 1000 companies. And they're saying, well, our lease cycle or our debt cycles should match the life cycles of our employment base. Um, that only makes sense. Otherwise, you've always got... A, a lot of excess and they're trying to carve that excess off of one way they balance their portfolios and shed a lot of lease liability, which is debt on the balance sheet is by utilizing our industry and running 10, 15, 20% of their employment base into flexible workspace. that has a rolling one year contract and that never hits their balance sheet. So 
they get two benefits. First, they win the war for talent by having a good flexible workplace program. Second, they shed debt from their balance sheet, which improves all of their valuation ratios and there's ultimately the stock price for all of the stakeholders. Yeah, no, that, that, uh, the balance sheet, um, I wonder if you could take a minute and just expand on that a little bit, because I, you know, I, I think is, uh, most of the audience, I, I think just from people I've talked with and, and, uh, you know, had a chance to talk with are either, uh, investors themselves, uh, or professionals or, or, or somebody who's looking to get into, um, commercial real estate. And, um, you know, one of the things that I don't know that it's fully understood uh, is the value of not having that long-term lease on your on your uh, your balance sheet if you're a you're a tenant. You know, if you have uh, whatever your company is, um, can you speak a little bit to that as, sure. as how they sure. they look at that and and why that's a preferred. <sighs> You know, that, that it, it's a critical issue. Um, let's assume that I am a large technology company with an employment base in the United States of 100,000 uh, people. And I lease on a 10-year basis my space to house and host those people. Uh, I, so I have a 10-year lease. Well, the first year is expensable. The year's two through 10 are a debt. A lease is nothing but a debt instrument. I mean, it's right. just like a loan, right? It's right. just, I have an agreement, you have an agreement to provide me a certain amount of space over a specific period of time and in a contractually based on my agreement to pay you and that contract creates a debt uh, and that debt becomes a liability on the balance sheet. Well, <clears throat> if you have extreme liability, if extreme uh, debt on your balance sheet, uh, you're not as good uh, a credit to the banks. That right. means you're also not a good a credit to the bond markets or your stock value has more exposure and risk. So anytime you can reduce the liabilities in your balance sheet, um, that's a very good thing. And if you can do it simultaneously it, while still being able to grow, that adds flexibility and agility that we talk about who, what's the big term for CEOs these days? Oh, he's a real agile or she's a real agile CEO. Well, adding agility to your business model through a more flexible workplace program uh, and a series of one year rolling contracts rather than 10, 15, 20 year leases or even a debt on owned properties is a much more agile structure. Uh, and that creates a better stock value ultimately. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you uh, going into that a little bit. I think the, um, uh, the thing that's always kind of caught my attention is how uh, I think some of these like Walgreens and these other, uh, I think a lot of it seems like it's drugstores have gone out and, <laughs> and uh, built out a, a large uh, footprint, you know, everywhere. And then after the, the building's up and they're operating, uh, they're looking to sell that and, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to buy in or, or, or buy or, or however that is, but just, you know, it, it, as somebody who looks at real estate as a, an asset that I'm wanting to own, cause I want the, the uh, tenant, um, you know, sometimes you forget the, the flip side of that, uh, how they, how they view, uh, the debt and how it affects and puts, you know, kind of a drag on their performance. And, uh, you know, how it doesn't make them as attractive to, like you said, the investors or bankers or, you know, bond market. Sure. And, well, look, uh, look at, um, oh, it's not real recently, but look at uh, large retail models um, uh, such as Sears. Yeah. Okay. Well, what killed Sears? Uh, facility. They had yeah. massive, massive investments in facilities and they couldn't generate enough revenue from their retail activities to support those facilities. And ultimately that brought them down. Uh, they also didn't change to an e-commerce model. It's funny, uh, you know, as, as the first catalog sales company, they should have been the first e-commerce sales company as well, but they, they just didn't make it there. Uh, <clears throat> kind of stuck in their own history. Um, but that's a simple example of, you know, 
that being a problem. Uh, at, at one point in the, when was it? It was in uh, about in the late 90s, uh, IBM's real estate department actually, because of the growth of um, the market in general during the first phase of the dot com era, uh, they actually put all their leases purposefully into their balance sheet, which they didn't have to back then, but they called them an asset because they had leased space at under market values and they were claiming the delta as an asset in their balance sheet. Um, that kind of got wiped out by their auditors a few years later, <laughs> uh -huh. but, but people have always played games with the balance sheet uh, and real estate uh, on, on both sides. From an investor's point of view, and I've owned a lot of investment properties and, and both residential and, and commercial, um, obviously you want to buy the property, uh, uh, hope you have a, a tenant or tenant group uh, that supports a uh, positive cash flow. Uh, so really, your debt side is uh, your balance sheet side is just a matter of uh, what your courage is with leverage. Uh, you know, are you going to go a ninety percent leverage or a zero percent leverage? Uh, myself, I'm a very conservative uh, person when it comes to debt. Uh, so uh, you know, I I think of the less is better and cash flow is, is good. I'm very right. much a, a cash flow investor. Well, definitely there's some, some people that uh, forget those, those good uh, lessons every now and then. And, and uh, that's why the cycle continues, I guess. <clears throat> um, so if you were to, uh, uh, I guess, point anybody that, that was either looking into, um, let me ask it this way. As the, the, the world continues to get smaller from the standpoint of, of technology and the ability mm -hmm. to be anywhere and work from anywhere, um, do you find that your type of the, the facilities that you guys are uh, placing clients in, are they, do they still tend to be in your larger metro areas or do you find that they're going into the tertiary markets or... Um, I, I, we're, the original concept started the central business districts of major market cities. Um, uh, uh, about uh, in the late 90s, uh, um, as technology started to evolve and allow more distributed work, um, we started seeing secondary uh, cities come up. And today, uh, the smallest village in Germany or Italy will have a business or co-working center. Uh, and they're all equally successful uh, relative to their costs. So I can build a center in Manhattan and I know that the dirt underneath the building is very, very expensive. Okay. Uh, but I know I still need to make a certain margin. Uh, I can do the same thing in Kansas City uh, or the same thing in Hutchison, Kansas, outside of Kansas City. And it's my margins will be about the same, maybe even a little bit better in those secondary markets. Um, and it's all based on the cost of the dirt under the building. I mean, lo location has a, a, a valuation uh, model and, and you just have to, to deal with that. Um, and one of the reasons we like our model, which is technology based, is that it doesn't require much of that thought process. We have a wholesale margin, we know what it is, doesn't matter where it is, uh, we don't have risk aside from marketing and customer management. So we've mitigated the risk um, through technology and by changing uh, our business model, even though we still serve the needs of a global real estate uh, client base. Well, it's fascinating how you guys have um, kind of inserted yourself in that and how the market, um, you know, I guess I'm just trying to think of, you know, back in the day when everybody uh, went to downtown, uh, to do work and here we are, everybody's working. Uh, I mean, people are, people are choosing more of their place where they want to live and, and employers, like you said, are being more flexible yeah, about yeah. that. And, and so yeah, this demand yeah. is, is, is and that, that's really important. And, and I'll use our own company as an example. Our a senior executive team is, is distributed globally. Um, and we have a uh, corporate headquarters here in Newport beach officially, but it's a tiny little, 
uh, I mean, we're in one of, of our own member buildings. <laughs> right. uh, 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 we practice what we preach when it comes to flexible work. Um, our chief marketing officer lives in Lexington, Kentucky. He likes horses. He likes that lifestyle. That's where his family is. Can you imagine if I had to move him or my CFO who lives in Las Vegas uh, or, or my chief administrative officer who's in Monterey, if, if I had to move all of them to Newport Beach, how disruptive that would be to their families, how right. costly it would be to the company. And I know our gentleman in Lexington, he would say, sorry, I'm going to get another job. I right. think, in fact, I think each one of them were, would. They have families there. Um, so the old way of, of centralizing a workforce was very disruptive to lifestyle and families and very, very costly. And again, we've been working remotely like this since the 90s uh, and totally paperless as a company since the early 90s as well. We've always been embedded in technology. And um, it just makes sense for the whole team and, and uh, everybody's life cycle and lifestyle is exactly the way they want it. No, I, it's fascinating, fascinating just to, to think about it and, and just think about the, you know, historically just the disruption and, and, you know, people having to pick up and move and, and all to be in a physical place. Um, you know, even though their work may not necessarily be local um, and just the, uh, Kind of the, I don't want to say the cost, but well, there is a cost. I mean, the, the, obviously there's a, there's a monetary cost, but just in then the relationship cost and stuff, and and um, you know, I guess for every yin there's a yang kind of thing. But but uh, it is, I guess, the flexibility from the the uh, talent side of the the uh, equation to be able to, um, you know, make a make a choice to work for a particular. Uh, company or or provider or whoever and still choose where they want to uh, be located is is uh, it's just fascinating I, I remember the first time I was meeting with a customer and and uh, all of a sudden his laptop laptop started making some noise he opened it up and it, <clears throat> he was looking at a guy from you know across the world and he said hold on I'm in a meeting I'll, I'll, let me call you back and I'm looking at my uh, what was that? You know, and it was basically the Jetsons right there and, and it was Skype and he's, you don't know Skype. I was like, like no. And, uh, but it's, it is fascinating just how it's really, I mean, and, and, and I don't even think that that much about it. I mean, anymore. I mean, here we are on a zoom call and, and, uh, you know, everybody's got FaceTime or whatever it is on their phones and, and, uh, you know, it just is. Well, it's, it, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to progress. I mean, right now we're working with uh, a couple of the, the larger video uh, gaming companies. So you talk about where do things go and how does that all work? Um, progression in real estate. Um, if you look at the video companies, um, <clears throat> they're starting to lose market share, not in terms of number of, of uh, people, but in terms of numbers of hours because the uh, marketplace is maturing and the kids that were on video all the time are going to college or they're going to getting jobs, et cetera. Um, if you look at that industry, they're also the best rendering companies in the world. They can create the most virtual reality environments better than anybody else. And they're already set for that. Uh, when you look at their distribution at any moment in time, you can have 50, 60, 100,000 people playing the same game at the same time, globally, across all borders. So what we've been looking at is the creation of virtual reality offices, where instead of going into a facility, you simply put on uh, your headset, uh, and now you're inside of that facility and you can interact directly with people uh, on a fully rendered basis uh, beyond the old style avatar structures uh, that we see. And what that means is when you talk about central business districts and major markets, take Manhattan as an example, um, you know, across the bridge, uh, office space in Brooklyn's a lot cheaper, but it's a lot nicer in Manhattan until you put on your headset. Now my, my office in Brooklyn is the same as if I was uh, in, a, in the Lipstick building overlooking Central Park. 
okay? And I've got a 2000 foot office with my own conference room in it, et cetera. Well, I can create all of that with technology now and with Microsoft's new HoloLens technology, I can actually just invite people directly into my office to meet with them physically, wow. even though they're not there. So when you think of that, then you think of real estate and you think of investment, if that comes to play, which we think about 2023, it will start. That's when we'll be starting with it at least. Um, uh, the uh, repurposing of commercial real estate is going to be massive. And the repurposing of that commercial real estate um, is going to radically change the way that cities are managed. And it could have a huge impact on residential costs going down and the way transportation moves around, et cetera. So as we look at flexible workspace, ultimately having that capability is, again, the next advancement in technology that we'll see that will have a major impact on commercial real estate, uh, virtual reality officing instead of physical officing. Do you have any sense of uh, how that'll affect valuations? I mean, I'm just thinking if people don't necessarily need to be in a space, um, is it's that... going to have an effect. Uh, it's going to impact valuations, primarily in the highest density markets first, because that's where the biggest costs are and that's where the migration will be from. Um, and what you'll also have is density compression. Uh, if uh, <clears throat> I have a nice office uh, in, a, in a high quality building, uh, it's going to be uh, 300 to 600 square feet. Uh, right. But in this environment, I can be in a, a relatively small cube uh, with a headset and a pair of haptic uh, gloves on, and I'm done. Wow. Okay, so I don't need e to have an equal quality office. Now, will I still want to go to an office? Sure. I want to go to lunch with my buddies. Right. I want to go work out after work, <clears throat> or I want to go get a beer or something. So I'm still going to want to be with other human beings, but when I'm slipping into my work mode, um, I'm going to have a different experience. I'll still be with people. It's just going to be, I mean, I'm going to be experiencing them differently. Yeah, no, that, that's fascinating to think about how, uh, you know, how the future looks like it's going to play out and, and, uh, you know, compared to the, uh, the cartoon, the Jetsons and what we all were presented back, you know, back when, and, uh, and how much of it is actually somewhat here and, and, uh, but the, this virtual thing is, it's kind of fascinating to, to think, think about. So. Well, well, by, by 2033, it'll be normal. <laughs> right. Right. No, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I just, it, it's, it'll, it'll be a, a standard just like, uh, I had my first video conferencing set in, in our offices in, uh, 1981. Okay. Oh, wow. So now it's standard, right? But in the eighties through the mid nineties, even up to about 2004 or five, um, it was sort of a rarity. You were definitely a trendsetter. Um, uh, yeah. We spent more money doing dumb things in front of everybody than I can imagine. Uh, but, but, but the technology worked. So it's, you have certain early adapters that pioneer stuff and, and pioneer ways to use the technologies and then you have the market. Right. Uh, and usually there's about a seven to 10 year lag. Right. Well, but those early, early adapters are ones that kind of help shape it. You know, if there's not adoption, um, you know, it won't, won't happen. So, well, my, my dad always told me, he says, you know, uh, pioneers get stuck full of arrows. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> don't be, a, don't be a pioneer. He said, build railroads instead. You'll, you'll, you'll be off a lot better off. Right. Right. <laughs> That's good. Hey, Frank, if we could, uh, I'd like to shift gears here for a second. Uh, as I mentioned to you uh, before, and I, I think we, we talked a little bit about risk, but just by day, I'm an insurance broker. And um, one of the things we do is try and manage risk with our clients. And uh, there's a couple of different strategies we consider when, when doing so. And the, the first strategy we look at is can we avoid the risk? Mm -hmm. uh, if we can't avoid it, then we look to see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. Mm -hmm. And if we can't avoid nor minimize the risk, then we look to transfer the risk. And that's mm -hmm. essentially what an insurance policy is. And um, I like to ask my guest and uh, would like to ask you if you can take a second and, 
and uh, consider what you consider to be the, the biggest risk. And uh, just for clarity's sake, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, with that, if you're willing, Frank Connell, I'd like to ask you, what is the biggest risk? Well, in, in our business, which functionally is commercial real estate, um, I think it's cyclicality, uh, getting caught on the wrong side of the cycle. Uh, and you've seen a lot of property investors uh, overall, and uh, market timing is, is always crucial. Uh, so cyclicality is probably the biggest risk. And the protection from that comes with uh, debt management. Um, uh, you can be highly, you can deal with cycles much more effectively if you have a, a, a debt, a prudent debt management program. Uh, so that comes back to what we were talking about with uh, leasehold liabilities being a part of that cyclicality exposure, uh, not just of uh, physical buildings that you own. Uh, and the debt cycle uh, of flexible workspace as opposed to a fixed workspace uh, where you have a fixed lease versus a service agreement is the most effective way to manage uh, the cyclicality in real estate and the cyclicality in business. No, that's, that's interesting. <clears throat> well, and definitely I think the, the debt and the cycle thing is, is um, something that we all should be aware of. And, and uh, clearly if you forgot the lessons of the last cycle, you'll get a chance to relearn <laughs> uh, the hard way in, in yeah. many cases, in many cases. Yeah, exactly. So Frank, where can the listeners go if they'd like to uh, connect or learn more? Um, a, a couple places. Um, first uh, would be alliancevirtualoffices.com. Alliancevirtualoffices.com. That's one of our primary uh, sites uh, overall. And if, uh, if you want to just learn more about our industry, uh, we also manage a, a publication called allwork.space. And allwork.space is the by far the largest uh, focused publication on flexible workplace sector. Uh, we have you know, two and a half million people on social media reach and, and uh, about 100,000 articles read a month and that sort of thing. So it's a, a very active publication that we do as a service. It's not a, it's a, a an unintentional nonprofit, uh, but we do publish that as a service to the industry and uh, just in general so that people can learn more about uh, flexible work and, and all the things that are involved with it. Got it. I will be sure to list that in the show notes for our listeners. And uh, Frank, I want to say thanks for uh, taking the time to talk. I've uh, enjoyed it, learned a lot, and uh, hope we can do it again soon. My pleasure. Look forward to it. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN. Radio.